I want to let you in behind the curtain because it's just something I find fun is that I preach on the same thing every time I ever preach. And some of you may pick up on it, uh, but if not, I'm just going to give it away. When I'm preaching, when I have this opportunity, that the theme that plays in my brain is Romans 12 too. Because I have these, you know, like these big, deep existential thoughts and I go into this kind of week where what in the world is the purpose of me getting up there and preaching? What am I going there to do? It's certainly not like a show, you know. There are more entertaining shows in the world if you guys want to watch a show. And another thing it's not, which comes to my brain, is uh, this is not your primary Bible study for the week. If this right here is your primary Bible study for the week, you are absolutely starving and you may not even know it. So this isn't the time, it's not my responsibility to get up here and, you know, feed you the Word of God that you are not getting anywhere else. Because like, that's certainly just not the case. This is a time where we get together on a Sunday morning and we worship the Lord together on this day of rest, right, that God gave us. He gave us this day to focus on Him, put away the work of the week, recalibrate, refresh, be encouraged, and get after it again tomorrow for another week. So this is a special time where we do sing together and worship the Lord together in many ways, and one of those ways is opening His Word and being encouraged by that. Um, so the purpose of it is equipment. This is just to shake off the week before, put on your gear for the week ahead, and get back after it. That's what this Sunday is for, this day of rest. So God gives us plenty of work to do all week. Right? And then on Sunday, he rested as an example. Uh, on Saturday, he rested. You know, you understand what I'm saying. He gave us a day of rest to refocus, recalibrate, and get back after it tomorrow. So I take the heart, the, the responsibility, uh, when I have these opportunities to preach, is to give you something that will help you get back after it tomorrow. Give you something to change your mind about something. Something that can plant a seed for you to go tomorrow morning and be about your studies, you know, your daily devotions can be strengthened by Sunday's time in the Word together. You know, um, that, that's my goal. So, so Romans 12, too, is kind of my jumping point for everything I ever get to say. Uh, my goal is, is this, and Romans 12, too, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So my goal every time I ever get to preach is transforming of your mind. Shift a little bit, or a lot, but some. Shift a little bit of your thinking closer to what God would have you think, so that that godly thinking just pervades your steps as you go tomorrow. That every encounter you have with the world in front of you, your family, your job, even just with God himself in your prayer time, just is a little bit different because your mind has been changed a little bit and your heart's been changed a little bit. So that, that's my goal as I get to preach. Um, and this week, we're going to be working out of um, Psalms because we've been in there for Sunday school. And another like behind the, behind the curtain thing is I think some people study the Bible like they both want. What I mean by that is, they start in the corner, they, they make a grid, make sure they cover everything, and they, they cover the lawn in a systematic way that is very effective and very good, and it, uh, it, it leaves nothing missed, but it's very systematic and linear and clean and organized, and that, I think that's good. Other people study the Bible in such a way, it's almost like, like, like do-it-yourself tutorials. You bring in some supplemental material, and you help that uh, just ignite your personal study. And again, I think that's perfectly fine as well. I tend to think that I study the Bible like I renovate a house. I get into something, and the more I get into it, the bigger the problem seems to be, and the more work it's going to require, and I generally spend more time on this thing that I noticed and picked on and opened up and worked on and tried to fix and found more issues and kept going and it takes more time than I usually expected to and it takes a lot more work than I usually expected to and more investment whether it's spiritually, emotionally, energetically or financially it requires
requires more of me than I would have expected going into this particular remodel or renovation. But that's the image that comes to my mind when I talk about my personal Bible study. I see a thing, I get after it, and it just grows on me. And I get fixated and it sticks me there. And the scripture just, uh, you know, the words that come to my, my mind, and hopefully these little seeds plant, the scripture just collides with my life in certain ways where I get stuck there until I'm not stuck there, until I move on to the next room or the next problem, you know, the next problem in the same building. And I'm pointing to myself, and I hope you pick up on that, you know. So we're in Psalm 73, and the reason for that is partially because we're going through Psalms in Sunday school, and another part of it is because what I see here is just the kind of material that I love to share with a group of people because we're seeing a fella who describes himself and a problem that he has, and we watch through his words a uh, transformation of thought, like Romans 12 too is. We see a guy who thinks like the world and then is confronted with God and his mind is transformed to a new way of thinking and a recalibration there. So with Romans 12 too as the, the, the backbone of any sermon I've ever given, we're looking at Psalm 73 as, as a man who's Thinking was like the world, and then it wasn't. It was transformed by the renewing of his mind through an encounter with God himself, and from there he walked differently. So with that being our goal, we're going to look at how it worked out for somebody, and I'm going to try very hard to focus just on what we see through this fellow named Asaph. We're going to not put his shoes on. We want to see him walk in his shoes, and then hopefully at the end we'll put his shoes on and understand how maybe it can affect us as we walk. But before that, I want to focus on him walking in his own shoes and see how that went before we try him on and take something with us there. So Psalm 73, uh, just quick, quick background. It was not written by David, most likely. It was written by this fellow named Asaph, who was commissioned by David. I've gotten to learn this. This was a, he was described in scripture as a seer. And he is responsible for a portion of the Psalms. And he seems to be a contemporary of David. And also in my reading, he seems to be younger than David. And I only base that on things that he wrote compared to things David wrote. It almost seems like Asaph is writing as one who's walking through life and discovering things. Where when David writes on the same subject, he writes almost as an old man teaching into those same things as one who's experienced so I only say that this is probably, in my opinion, he's somebody younger than David. I know he's a contemporary, and I know David commissioned him to be a songwriter in this court. Um, and I assume, just based on what I told you, that he's younger, because he seems to write as a younger person, whereas David writes on the same topics as more experienced. So that's what I have on ASAP for you. So he wrote this psalm, Psalm 73, and we're going to focus this morning on the second half of it. Um, but I'm going to give you a, a couple sentences of review on what the first half is. If you could sum up the first half of Psalm 73, it basically says this. God, I know you're good. The most wicked people I see in this world, though, seem to have it very good. And I'm working very hard to do a good job for you. And the most wicked people I can think of seem to have it better than me. And that's the first half of Psalm 73. Here's what I see, God. The wicked are prospering. They have an ease of life that I don't understand. They have more than they could ever ask for. And I'm struggling. And that's what he says in the first half of Psalm 73. So we're going to look at the second half because there's a hinge verse where the thinking that Asaph shows in the first half changes over and it changes everything. So let's pray <coughs> together. And we're going to look at Psalm 73. What was learned? What changed in his mind to change the way he thought? And change the way he saw. Um, and then at the end, we'll try to put on his shoes and maybe see similarities between the way that we have looked or do look at things and transform the way we think about them into a way that helps us walk closer with God after that pivot. So we'll pray together and we'll get into the second half of Psalm 73. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, which is the truth. Thank you that You've given us what we need to, um, to live as your children. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. 
which brings us into your family. We thank you for making a way where there was no way. Thank you for bridging a gap that we can never cross. Thank you for calling us yours and treating us as yours and loving us as yours. And, um, and basing all that on your strength, your love, and your faithfulness. And, and truly, in the grand scheme of things, Lord, asking very little of us uh, in contrast to what has been given to us. Lord, truly, you ask us for everything, and it's literally nothing compared to what you've done. So I just pray that as we get into your word and, and transform our minds to uh, a way of thinking that, um, that proves your good and perfect will, pray that we can put off the way we were born thinking and the way that the world would have us think and just be transformed this morning together and then walk in it tomorrow and continually so. And we love you and we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. So I told you what the first half of Psalm 73 was about. God, I know you're in control and I know you're good, but the wicked people of the world seem to be doing quite well, and I don't get it. It actually says in verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Like, I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around it, and it hurt, I didn't like it. And then verse 17 is a hinge. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. I'm going to read from here to the end of the, the chapter, and then we're going to come back and walk slower through it. It says in verse 18, Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they're brought to desolation as in a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You've destroyed all those who desert me for our children. But it's good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. It all started in verse 17. The change in his thinking started in verse 17. And the change of his thinking came with a change in his perspective. Um, I'm going to say something very simple. It's one of those simple, profound things. What you see is different based on where you stand. Um, if you stand... Here's, here's one picture I have in my brain of this. You stand in front of a cornfield, and you see a cornfield. But if you were standing on a big hill, maybe you see a corn maze. You had no idea, because you were standing in the wrong place to see what was really there. And from, from your perspective, from where you were standing, what you saw was accurate. I just see a bunch of corn. No, maybe from a different perspective or a different place you can see what's really there. Because really, if there's a corn maze, like intricately designed corn maze, and you have all that information to work with, you're not going to call it just a bunch of corn. It's very clearly something way more complicated than that. And only a fool would look at a corn maze and say, just a bunch of corn. You just didn't have that perspective when it was right in front of your face sometimes. So what I'm saying is, where you are affects what you see. And there was a perspective gained in verse 17 where Asaph says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood there. And it was in approaching God and being near to God that he was then able to see more clearly and more accurately the things that he just described as something very different. So what he just described was how good the wicked have it. They have an ease of life. They have prosperity. They have more than they could ever ask for. And I am tormented. But then, I put my feet somewhere different to see something, to see it in a different way. And from next to you, God, here's what he has to say about those same wicked people. You set them in slippery places. What's a slippery place? It's a place where you can fall at any minute. What's more slippery than being far from God? But at any moment, you meet God at the judgment seat and not as his child. What could be more slippery than a place where you're viable to fall and fall hard at any second. 
And from a slippery place, it's very hard to gain footing and move uphill. God, you set them in a slippery place. When you think of the wicked who prosper, what could be slipperier than rejecting God and having an ease of life? What could be worse than standing in a place where everything seems great, but you're one second away from eternal damnation? What's more slippery than that? And from the proper perspective, Asaph sees that. He said, how terrible would it be if God didn't chasten me when I was in the wrong? How bad would it be for me if God gave me an ease of life instead of loving attention as a father does his children? How slippery that is. How close they are to destruction. How hard it is to climb a slippery slope. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they're brought to desolation as in a moment. It's imminent. These people's eternal life is on a downward path, and that future is imminent for them. Just as it's imminent for us to be with the Lord in glory, like the eight-year-old, right? He's not worried. He's good, you know? And it was any moment that could happen to any one of us, and it was him, and now he's all set. There's nothing to worry about for that little boy. But if he didn't know the Lord, it's a totally different story we have to tell. So praise God for him and his family. And praise God that we are not standing on a slippery slope of an ease of life and great prosperity despite rejecting God. They're utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream of one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. He's starting to see from where he's standing now. Those people don't have it good. They have it very, very bad. It just seemed really good because I was looking at it, and we'll get to right where he was looking at it from. Verse 21 says, My heart was grieved. I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. So here's the, the coming in terms of where he was at. Lord, I was looking at life like I was an animal. I was looking at life like there's nothing bigger than the food in front of my face and the competition of the other animals in the world. That's how I was seeing it, God. I was so foolish. It broke my heart to realize that I was living before you as an animal does. Just feed me. Give me comfort, give me peace, and I will fight and scratch with all the rest of the animals for those things that I want. He was looking at it like an animal looks at the world. Unfortunately, in verse 23, if, if we ever find ourselves looking at the world with, you know, not maybe like an animal is harsh, but as the natural man sees it, as the old man sees it, he says, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. Even when my brain works wrong, even when I do wrong, I'm continually with you. And he says, because you hold me by my right hand. You know, we are not, even in our worst moments, we're not unattached from our God who does hold us by his right hand. And I think that's an excellent thing for Asaph to have written here, especially for the future people to read it. Because in our worst moments, we're not separated from God who's holding us by our right hand. <coughs> You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. He's starting to realize, and maybe not realize as he's writing, but he's writing of him realizing that the wicked have it very bad and I have it very good. His mind has been utterly transformed from where he was at to where he currently stands. And it came with going to the sanctuary of God, getting out of the mess, and getting his eyes off of the thing right in front of him, and going to God and seeing things from there, from a proper perspective, not just a different perspective. It says in verse 25, Who am I in heaven but you? And there's none upon earth that I desire besides you. Who, what power could I appeal to to change the world in front of me? There is no karma. There is no, you know, there is no animal being spirit. There is nothing besides God in heaven who can make it make sense that the wicked seem to have it good and I have it really bad. Only when he goes to God does the perspective actually change. There's no, um, there's no make-believe magic formula for that. It's just going to God and there's none upon earth that I desire besides you. There's no other remedy for what he was seeing. There's no other way to transform his thinking. It says in verse 26, My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So again, just reiterating, I was wrong, and I'm very thankful for a God who was right. 
We saw Asaph looking at the world around him with envy. He saw people who seemed to have it very good from a very narrow, very incorrect perspective. And only in coming closer to the Lord does he see from a proper perspective that those people have it very bad and he has it very good. Um, now this concept, I feel like there are more ways than just that to look at the people around us. And just a couple come to mind, and um, a couple other passages of scripture come to mind. One way is this envy that, that Asaph saw. Um, if you want to turn with me to Titus 3 quickly, there's another way you can look at the people around you. And I would say it's equally as wrong in its perspective on people. Titus 3, you are ahead. This is a passage that has stuck with me and struck me for a long time. It, it comes after a portion about um, how we look at rulers and authorities. Uh, people who we have in our mind a lot of the time, for whatever reason. It says in verse 1 of chapter 3, remind them, this is Paul writing to Titus about how he's to you know, instruct his congregation essentially, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Now here's the hard part. Speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. I find that to be one of the hardest verses in all scripture to, with a good conscience, say that I believe what God says and I walk in it. Speak evil of no one. There's no loophole attached to this. And I believe I've shared this with you before, but this is where I wish there was a loophole. It said, speak evil of no one unless they deserve to be spoken evil of. But that doesn't say that. It makes it much harder when it says, speak evil of no one. It doesn't give us a way out. Speak evil of no one. Cut and dry, clear as day. As a coach, if I tell a kid something that cut and dry, I expect them to understand it perfectly well and do what I ask them to do. As a God, he probably expects the very same. I didn't, he didn't make this fluffy or mystical. Speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Now here's the reason why. Here's the change your mind on how you see things thing. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, <clears throat> not by works of righteousness as we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So if Asaph was looking at the people around him with envy, I would say that what's being warned against here is looking at the people around you with the sense of entitlement that you don't deserve. Me and God don't like how you people operate. If you're the little spoiled kid who's with God, instead of the, the thankful recipient of so great a salvation, you're the spoiled little kid talking bad about everybody else who was just like you were before God's kindness shown, shown, was shown to you. We like to treat those people with speaking evil of them. It seems right. But that's not what brought us into God's family. It was the kindness of God and His grace that changed us from the people we don't like to the people that we are now. And again, and I'm not saying it's easy. Actually, I say it's hard. But there's a wrong way to look at people. Asaph looked at people like they had it better than him. And in getting closer to God and seeing things from God's perspective, we realized it was very wrong. What's being warned against here in Titus was don't look at the people around you like an entitled little brat. God brought you into his family by grace and with kindness. So who are you to stand there under his umbrella and speak evil to people who need what you got? So don't look at people wrong. Not with envy, because they have it very bad. And it's very slippery where they are. And not with entitlement, because you needed what you refused to show them. The kindness of God. There's a third way that I think, and I'll just say it. There's a third way that I look at people that's wrong, that needs adjusting. Um, and if you turn to Mark 6, you see... Uh, the beginning part of a very, very familiar passage. This is right before the miraculous fish and loaves. 
And it strikes home for me because we're all built different. And when God describes in Ephesians the old man, our old men were all like oriented the same, but they're flavored a little different. My old man is grumpy and like the selfishness that I would like fight for is my own peace and quiet and comfort. Like I just want rest at any expense. Like you guys, like whatever needs need to be filled, I put those aside because I want to rest. So this strikes me in my little heart. Um, so this is right before the fish and the loaves. Mark 6, verse 30. So this is just after they described about John the Baptist being killed and right before the fish and the loaves. So Mark 6, verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus, and they told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. He knew they were tired, and he wanted them to withdraw and to rest. So already, what I want to do is stop right there. And when I'm tired, I want to say, Jesus says to go to a deserted place and rest a while. But it keeps going. It's one of those things, there's no loophole for me getting what I want to get out of it. It says, For there were many coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. These folks who were working and telling Jesus the work they've been doing, they didn't have time to eat. He says, come rest. So, verse 32, they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing. And many knew him and ran there on foot from all cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and told all the people to go home because he came there to rest. We're tired and we haven't eaten yet. Give me a break. Who's reading in their Bible right now that doesn't say that? <laughs> right? That's the old man coming out. That's just me. Verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. People will wear you out. People are the best and worst thing in the world. I love them, but they drive me nuts. Even the ones I love the most drive me the most nuts. But just looking at the world at large, the people who aren't in your house, the people that you feel an extra obligation toward, and you know it's clear that, and then there's there's returns on your investment. You see your kids grow, and you, you can give them more than you might want to give to the people who just want your attention. You give. So instead of looking at them how I want to look at them, like, I need rest and I can't do this right now. Why is my phone ringing at 2 in the morning? Why are you knocking on my door? There's all the believers around that can have this conversation with you right now. There has to be. Because I haven't even eaten yet. And I'm tired. I just did all these things. And Jesus said I could rest. But you need something right now. So instead of looking at the world, and I'm talking to me. I'm talking to the monster in the mirror. Instead of looking at the world as a bunch of people who want to rob you of your peace and quiet and deserved rest, look at them as people who are like sheep without a shepherd. I'm not saying that every person that you talk to, I'm not saying that when you're tired you talk to somebody, all set. Like, God, thank you for that divine appointment. There's another believer in the world. But I'm saying that maybe that could happen. Maybe it won't, but maybe it will. Maybe that day is the day that that person has a little chip in the armor or a little opening of the door and they're coming to you because they have questions that you pray at times that somebody will come and ask of you. But today's that day, the day that you're tired and you haven't eaten yet. This person isn't there to rob you of your peace. Maybe he is, but maybe he's not. Maybe this is the day that the door's a little bit open and today is the day that he'll receive the gospel. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not, but maybe it is. But it's worth checking. So we see people in the wrong light at times. Sometimes we can be envious. Now we're going to put on ASAP shoes for a second. Does it seem at times that people who do wicked things have it better than you? Financially, where it stands out to me the most, I don't think I care about money as much as some people do. But they have this ease of life sometimes, and they get away with more. Everything just seems to happen right do you see them for what you think you want, or do you see them for what you know they need? Are they on a slippery slope, or are they on easy street? 
from the right perspective, they're on a slippery slope. And if you change the way you think through these things, allow yourself to think how God thinks instead of how the old man thinks, how the beast of the field thinks, they don't have something you don't have. You have something they don't have. If they saw things from the proper perspective, they would be envious of you. In Titus, we can look at people who do wrong and do evil directly to us as, as people who deserve to be spoken evil of. And maybe rightly so. But we shouldn't be so entitled as to think that we don't owe them the same love that God showed us when we were just in their same shoes. A blink of an eye, though. If life is a vapor, then it was not, you haven't gained any ground in being above these people at all. You, you were just there, and now you're not. You, you know, there's no entitlement there. There's just thankfulness. And the only way to truly show you appreciate that is to show it. If you can't show it, then it's truly, I'm not saying that, you know, God's still holding your hand, but you're thinking like a beast. That's the old man thinking. And finally, people in the world are not out there just to rob you of your peace and quiet, Derek. They're, they're people out there, and they're like sheep without a shepherd, and they desperately need what you have, and you should praise God for the opportunity to share, even if you haven't eaten yet. Verse 27, back in Psalm 73. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You destroyed all those who deserve you from our you. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Be changed in your thinking today. Imagine not showing the kindness that God showed you, or imagine seeing a sheep without a shepherd, and you just see them as somebody who is robbing you of your peace. Imagine seeing somebody on their deathbed, and you are jealous of them because they don't have to go to work tomorrow. And you're seeing, like, the people who Asaph is seeing are on a slippery slope, ready for death, and they're gone. And he's jealous of them because they have more money than he does. Imagine seeing somebody on their last leg like, oh, they don't have to go to work tomorrow. I do. What a simple little tiny animal brain that takes to, to do that. What we do it. So Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, and like in Psalm 73, Asaph went from one extreme to another. And the, the transformation of his mind was in seeing things from God's perspective. Um, I'm just going to read verse 28 again. It's good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. So let that be true of us. Draw near to God. See things from standing there. And they'll be different than from down here. So let's pray together. And let's take this with us as we go. Dear Lord, again, we just come to you together and thank you for your word, which is the truth. It's convicting, and it's encouraging, and it's challenging. And all in all, most importantly, Lord, it's from you, and it's true, and we need it. Lord, let us adjust. Let us take in what we've learned from you and be different because of it. Lord, let us not waste, let us not waste your time. And, you know, let us not tarry and like, drag things out. And let us not be like animals. Let us see things how you see them and live accordingly. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray for this week ahead that we, we live and look like we belong to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.